worldwide there are 342 million diabetics. The deaths in um, 2010 were 3.4 million. So basically it's 1% of the population of di who have diabetes will die annually. The number of people that are going to develop diabetes over the next 20 years is going to be astronomical. When they first told me she had diabetes, you know, it was just like, me now, I got diabetes, but there's nothing wrong with me now. To me, it, it's going to kill me if I don't fix it. I don't, if I don't do anything about it. Diabetes is a major disease of this era especially for Native Americans. We have our vegetables for my, Some of my friends, longtime friends, they're already gone due to diabetes. And um, it just, it, 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 it scared me. The Native American population with respect to diabetes is particularly hit hard. I know that I need to be healthy. I know that I'm gonna have kids one day, I know that. I don't want to put them through the pain that, you know, I, I had to go through. It was so hard. So we need to do something now to be able to survive later. Over 89? Did you, did you take any of your medicines today? Yeah, I took one. Let me check your sugar real fast, okay? Let's pick a finger, okay? We check random levels and we check fasting blood sugar levels. A target range, non diabetic patient, their fasting blood sugar should be less than 100. How was it? 177? 177. Okay. I was diagnosed. At the age of 37, it was like, you know, they told me, they gave me a regimen. They told me, you got to do this, you got diabetes. It kind of freaked me out, you know, because my sister was going through it and, you know, my brother. And, and when I first got diagnosed, I, I dropped 50 pounds. I was walking, walking, walking. I walked. But then, um, kind of got off, off the regimen. And... Gain the weight back. I'm just going to listen up here for a minute. Eric Osceola came to us. A lot of times we will draw screening blood tests on individual and then try to draw them back to address the diabetes. He was aware of it. He was aware of his increased weight and he came to us. Well, I haven't exactly been keeping up with my diabetes. You know, before, a few years ago, I was really into keeping up with it, but I haven't been taking care of my diabetes, so, you know, I'm here to try to get back on track, and I got a lot to live for, so, Absolutely. you know, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. So, the weight loss is a major issue with me because, you know, I'm always uncomfortable, you know, and it's just like I have to do something. Well, looking at a chart, I reviewed it before it came in, you certainly have a long history of diabetes. Yes. The cholesterol and triglycerides have been high. Yes. The blood pressure has been high. Mm -hmm. And also, you've had a positive stress test in the past a couple years ago. Yeah. So you have quite a few indicators that indicate that your health isn't the best, and it's a great idea to try to get started. When Eric and I first discussed diabetes, he had insight into the disease. He realized that his in the past, his diet, his lifestyle, had led him to the current condition he was in. Diabetes is basically elevated blood sugar levels. And these blood sugar levels are elevated because there's a combination in most people of not enough insulin production and that insulin not working well. There are many types of diabetes. The two major ones are type 1 diabetes, which we usually attribute to younger uh, kids developing and they need insulin lifelong to treat the diabetes. And type 2 diabetes, which used to be called adult onset diabetes. The disease in type 1 diabetes and the disease in type 2 diabetes uh, is different. Type 1 diabetes, there's an 
autoimmune destruction of the insulin producing cells and so the efforts there are to try and replace these cells but but prevent rejection of these cells from the body. How diabetes develops is to, to maintain normal blood sugars you need a number of things to, to occur. You need the the insulin producing cells in the pancreas, which are called the beta cells, to be able to make insulin. Insulin enters the circulation, the bloodstream, and it goes to muscle cells, it goes to liver cells, it actually even goes to fat cells. And it allows glucose that's in the circulation, so sugar in the circulation, to get into these cells, into the muscle cells, into the fat cells, into the liver cells. And there the glucose is metabolized or can be stored for energy later on. Diabetes occurs if, number one, that insulin producing cell doesn't produce enough insulin to get this sugar from the circulation into these various muscle cells and liver cells and fat cells, or, and or the insulin is being produced but the insulin is not effective. So it, it goes to the muscle cell and tries to open the door to let glucose in but it doesn't do that very effectively and so instead of needing one molecule of, in, of insulin to get one glucose in, you might need two molecules of insulin or three molecules of insulin. Diabetes is a lifelong condition, so there is no cure for diabetes. Gentamo. Hello, I'm Everett Osceola, and here I'm with Eric Osceola tribal member, businessman, and soon-to-be motivationalist. Can you tell us a little bit about your idea? Well, my idea started with uh, the fact that uh, diabetes runs big in my family with my older sister passing away some eight years ago. And uh, my brother passed away from the same diabetes like two months ago. and. I also been diagnosed with diabetes. Now, what you want us to do is you want us to follow you for a year, but what else do you want us to record? Well, the main thing is just uh, the struggle, the the hard work, you know, and what it's gonna take for me to not only get my life back on track, but my health is most important, you know, due to the fact that, uh, you know, I'm 50, 47 years old and uh, you know I'm getting older not younger and to me it, it kind of feels like it's my last chance. The Native American population with respect to diabetes is particularly hit hard. The number of people, the percentage of people in this country with diabetes is around 8.3 percent. If you look at uh, Native Americans and Pacific uh, Islanders it's up to over 16 percent. So those are astounding statistics. And actually the group of individuals that has the highest risk of diabetes across the world are the Pima Indians. Pima and the Maricopa tribes. The uh, history of this tribe dates back a long way, even before the birth of Christ. And uh, we've been farmers for, and working off the land for all that time. I think it's important that we need to look back at our history and uh, realize that uh, diabetes was not happening then. Since the river dried up in the early part of the last century, it almost created a disillusion for what the future will bring uh, because we don't have water. And what's interesting, this, these are the Pima Indians that are in Arizona that are on the reservations. Uh, in the adults, one out of two has type 2 diabetes, which is just mind-boggling. Now there are Pima Indians that are still in Mexico where they originally migrated from and the prevalence uh, of diabetes in those communities is around 6 or 7 percent, not 50 percent. It's still high. We still know that there's a genetic predisposition in these Pima Indians, but when you expose that genetic predisposition to an environment that encourages increased weight and a sedentary lifestyle, you bring out those abnormalities. Today you got hot dogs, pizza, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, everywhere you look, and I, and, I, and I know that for myself, and they tell you to stay away from the sugar, stay away from the grease. It's, it's hard. The Seminole Tribe's incidence of diabetes runs toward the middle of the statistics. And, it, and when you, especially when you have a small community, the Seminole 
a tribe of Florida is a relatively small community. Uh, you can't afford to have a quarter to 30 percent of your uh, individuals uh, compromised, shortened lifespans. That damages the community as a whole. There's the genetic predisposition, there's the weight issue, and there's a lifestyle issue. Those are the three keys um, to why the incidence is high. Genetics you can't do much about. The thrifty gen genotype hypothesis is just that, it's a hypothesis. And uh, the, the thought is this, if you have a population that for hundreds and hundreds of years went through periods of famine uh, or lack of access to food, the ones that survived were the ones that could hold on to all of their calories as efficiently as possible. And so the, the, the natural selection over thousands of years would be to have individuals who, are, who have very slow metabolisms because they can hang on to the calories and when there's no food, they can go longer, they can survive longer because they have all these stores. Now you take those same individuals that have been selected to survive in environments where there's no access to food and you now increase the access to food or you overdo the access to food and now they have a metabolism that's slow because that allowed them to survive those thousands of thousands of years but now they have all the food that they want and what happens is that they become obese and they develop all of the consequences of obesity in terms of high blood pressure and poor cholesterol and the risks of heart attacks and strokes and diabetes. My first impression of Eric um, was that he fit the profile of a middle-aged seminal. He uh, was overweight, um, he didn't exercise much, um, and he didn't really watch his diet much. I was the fourth born out of five kids, and I had a, what's it called, a, a good but rough upbringing, no money. My mom worked at the Amphenol up here. We were in HUD housing. You know, when it got cold, it got cold inside, with little heaters and stuff, but my mom and my dad made it do. And, you know, growing up was good and bad. I lost my father at nine years old to uh, um, an accident. After he died, I rebelled against my mother. You know, when my mom tried her best, but, you know, I started going out and hanging out with their own friends or whatever. You know, it got to the point where, and I came home one time, my mom started spanking me, so, you know, I couldn't cry, I couldn't, you know, I had nothing else to do but turn around and told her, you ain't gonna spank me no more, you know, I just, that's it. After that, I kind of went with my sister, moved in with my sister, Cindy. I would have to say if there's anybody that really played a big part in my life, was my sister Cindy. Well, it turned out to be almost like my mother, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, just be being there, you know, when I, that's when I started getting into alcohol heavy too, and I got to a lot of crazy mischief, you know. You know, she was always standing by my side, no matter what, if I went to jail, if I went to hospital, or if I, you know, cause, you know, we was into all kind of stuff, you know, but she was always there. They first told me she had diabetes, you know, it was just like me now, I got diabetes, but there's nothing wrong with me now. But, you know, it affected her, I don't know why, but it affected her more rapidly. If you can keep those blood sugars controlled, you can avoid complications of diabetes. And what we're really concerned about are the long-term complications of diabetes, the eye damage, the kidney damage, the nerve damage that leads to amputations, the heart attacks, the strokes, the, the end-stage renal disease. I remember when it first happened, I think we were out of town, and I guess she already had diabetes, but something had got on her foot, like a little piece of wood or something got stuck in there. And I remember, but it was really hurting her, and I didn't know what was going on. She was with Victor then, and, but they had took it out and all that, but she couldn't walk or anything. And, I just remember you know, as little kids back then, you know, I was mad. I was like, hey, can we go to the park and all that? But I remember that's when it first started. 
you know, it affected me real bad because she had kids too, you know, my nieces and nephews that, you know, were a big part of her life and they had to see all this go through. And then from then on, from that little, just a little cut, you know, it, it came led to amputation of her leg, you know, both legs, and it came to her fingers and all that. So I was about like seven or eight. You know, me being like her son too, you know, it hurt me, it really, really, really hurt me. I know that I need to be healthy. I know that I'm gonna have kids one day, I know that. I don't want to put them through the pain that, you know, I, I had to go through. It's just hard to talk about it, cause, you know, when I lost my first daughter to diabetes, it was so hard. You need to know that being healthy don't just you're not just healthy. It comes with a lot of things. It comes with you live longer. You're, you're able to be there for your kids, your grandchildren. You're able to see your mother grow old. You know, it's a lot of benefits from being healthy. You know that I can say that. You know, I wish she was there. Diabetes can be treated, and a lot of times it can be treated without medication. Lifestyle intervention, dietary intervention could be very effective if it's implemented properly. What we're going to talk about today is healthy meal planning for diabetes. I think one of the main things that I see from my end of it is People, they, they tend to think that they need to change everything. It's not necessarily the case. Because, you know, just starting small, doing small changes can make a huge difference. And So I have over here, I'm going to make for you today a smoothie. It's balanced, it has a variety of different foods, and it's high in fiber. The smoothies are great because they're quick, they're easy, you can grab and go, and you would eat things that you would normally probably not eat. You're like, kale, this is going to have kale in it. <laughs> So we know where your son gets it from, right? <laughs> so we're going to put yogurt in it. So you use yogurt instead of like milk or water? Mm -hmm. Yogurt, it gives you that calcium and it gives you protein. So it helps that digestion and absorption and all that kind of slow down. We hold a, a variety of different classes and we're teaching them about just healthy foods. And, and it's more than just teaching them about the foods, it's getting them to try it. And then we have our grapes. Okay, and then we have apples. And then just to make sure it doesn't get all stuck. And then we have some greens. You can do kale or you can do spinach. They're both very mild and very, very nutritious. If you notice, we're all going to smell it. I know. <laughs> it's it's just, if I didn't know everything else that was in it, then I probably wouldn't drink it. But it's good. Very good for you. Very good for you. Now we can sell the thing for for the people who would never use a machine. The what? The Teach people how to use a machine. Yeah. I don't have a blender. For mm -hmm. what? I have never had to use it. Yeah. And never had the smoothie. Mm -hmm. I seen the mix. Uh, seen it in bars when they mix drinks. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. That's yeah. the first time I've seen, you know, a blender. Yeah. So yeah. I would assume that. You would have a bar. I just never prepared any kind of food or meal or, or of anything like that before. And what I taste with this one here, it tastes pretty good. It's more than medication and eating right and exercise. There's emotions. There's choices. There's family members. There's history. There's there's so much more to it than just you know, I'm telling you you need to take your medication. I'm telling you you need to eat right, and I'm telling you you need to exercise. I had to learn what it was all about, the diabetes itself, after I realized that that was happening to me. The doctor told me, when I think when I was about 21, that he says, you're on the borderline of being a diabetic. And I'm thinking, what is that? I just had to do, um, try to lose weight and stuff, and then later they told me I had diabetes, and then they put me on insulin. Um, 
my mom was diabetic and then she passed away from diabetes, the infection and stuff, so, some kind of infection. When I found that I had them, I was thinking, oh my God, I have to close myself up, keep myself away from having fun or having to associate and going out with people because I might hurt myself. And I'm going to lose a limb, you know, lose something <laughs> because of the infection of me getting hurt and having fun. And I, it scared me a lot. When I found out, it scared me too. Some of my friends, longtime friends, they're already gone due to diabetes. And um, it just, it, 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 it scared me. You know, they're, the way they feel about it. It's, I had my mom that was diagnosed and she had, you know, toes amputated and, you know, my dad was on dialysis and it's scary to them. And, you know, it's, it's, they're real people and they, they have real, real feelings and emotions that surround being a diabetic. Then I only got one kidney now, so it's kind of, they're digging it into me more every time I go to the clinic. I really have to watch what I eat. And, and it is a big lifestyle change, but um, I'm still working on it. It throws you into a, a, um, into a lifestyle where you're gonna have to, whether you wanna do it or not. Because of that, I wasn't gonna have fun. What I've learned is that, you know, you've got to make the effort. And nobody can do it for you. The doctors can give you medicine, the doctors can tell you what to do, and family can tell you what to do, you know, what's this, what's that, but ultimately it's up to you. We're here this early Saturday morning at the BB&T Center for the Step Up and Walk Out Diabetes event, where everybody is getting together for this great cause. This is one of those things that you can take some action yourself to help keep yourself well. As uh, a team, we feel like we're helping, you know, with what all's going on. And also our uh, tribal members can go around to each table and get information about diabetes and uh, whatever to help their illness. Everett Osceola here with SMP. I'm here with Eric Osceola. So how do you feel today participating at the Diabetes Walk? Well, it's a good start to my journey. You know, I'm here to help out and support the Diabetes Walk. You know, my first time being here, my first time being in any event. You got to start somewhere. So, you know, it's just the start of my journey. Losing the weight, the 100 pounds is a big goal of mine. How are we feeling after the walk? Feeling good. Got to pick up my energy. My blood pressure good. I'm doing better. Thank you. We're in a society where it's difficult to be physically active. It's much easier to be sitting here talking <laughs> to you uh, as opposed to exercising or doing something active. Now you gotta take a minute and 15 seconds and breathe. You wanna go to the gym and see everybody running around? Oh. Yeah. Brings back the memories where I wanna be. Of course. Yeah, that's all you gotta do, man. Just keep your eyes on the prize and just focus on those things, man. Anytime you start to fall off, yeah. off to the side and you don't feel like coming, think about where you know yeah. you're supposed to be. Make every moment productive. The 
it's like every building it doesn't it can't it can't be built by one man. Yeah. Every vision can't be built by one man. You're like you need help. You need yeah. people that, that keep you hot. You yeah. need people to keep you going. Yeah, keep you, keep you focused. Yeah. Say hey, hey, you need what you doing? What you yeah. doing? Hey man, I get your ass up. Let's go, let's go. We out here. Then we, get, then we have nine o'clock appointment. Yeah. And people do that because they care. Yeah. Like oh, here you go again. You gotta expect that. Yeah. People that who don't care ain't gonna do that. A gloomy day, folks. Hey, what's up, man? You good? Right. You running? No, I'm gonna be calling your name at the finish line. Oh, okay. I'll see you at the finish line, baby. Ready? Osceolo is an excellent uh, example of an individual who is motivated to address diabetes. And your blood pressure is good. How's your sugar been? It's been good. He's read 101 a lot ago. He hasn't taken any shortcuts. A lot of times we have individuals who want gastric bypass or banding. Those are sort of shortcuts that in the long run aren't that successful. Eric did it by a lifestyle change. The changes in your medicine, he's going to decrease your blood pressure, which is good. That's your diabetic medication. He wants to see you back in four weeks. That's okay. already mean. Stop at the front desk so they can tell you the date. That's it? Well, yeah, I can't see you. I'm free. You're free to go. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, you got me in the camera. I'm about to get you. I'm <laughs> on my bad hair, <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, Eric. All right. Our genetics haven't changed in hundred years or so. It's not our genetics that have changed, it's our environment that has changed and has gotten us, you know, everything is easier, right? You get the car to go to the supermarket a mile. Now, well, if you didn't have the car and you were walking to that supermarket, you'd be burning 200 calories walking back and forth that mile to the supermarket. Well, 200 calories a day, you know, 100, uh, 100 days, that's 2,000, 20,000 calories. First thing I get up in the morning, I take my blood sugar and I take my uh, blood pressure and see where they stand. And if they're too high, no, I don't eat those. But if it's beginning to feel low, the sugar feeling, if it's low, you start to shake and it wakes you up. So you go and you get the proper food that you were taught to eat at that time. When you have diabetes, it's 24-7, 365 days a year. You don't get a break because you have to think about what is my blood sugar, how much can I eat. I try not to eat foods right away if it's low. That would jerk it up high, because once I, I, I jerk it from low to high, I feel kind of dizzy, I feel kind of tired, because it went from one extreme to the other. You really don't know uh, the condition of their uh, diabetes, because you don't know what's going on in, in and out their body. One of the biggest obstacles in treating tribal members, which is also the same in the general community, is that, again, initially with diabetes, you have no symptoms. You don't feel poorly. So 
it's hard to have somebody change their life and their lifestyle when they don't feel badly. You never have to uh, show symptoms of alcoholism if you stay off of it, away from it, you know, and you know what you've got to do if you are on it and you're willing to get off of it. Same, same with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. Sixty years ago, if you look at um, our population, we were a lot thinner. Um, so the obesity epidemic is one reason that diabetes um, is more prominent today. I've been told is that you look at labels. You know, you, you think to yourself, ah, I don't feel with labels. But when the, the, the experience of diabetes hits you, you, you go and you read. You don't have an attitude about it. Just in the American Indian youth, uh, over a period of about uh, six to seven years, uh, they have recorded uh, an about 70% increase in the number of youths, uh, so children, adolescents, and young adults with type 2 diabetes. Huge. And all of that can possibly be traced to the fact that our young uh, children or young adults nowadays are more sedentary, more overweight, have easier access to calories that are not necessarily nutritious, but certainly hypercaloric. Lots of calories that go in that are not burned, which contributes to weight gain and weight gain contributing to the risk of diabetes. You look at the carbohydrates, if it's high, the total is 17. Some of that carbohydrates will turn into sugar once your body gets the energy from the carbohydrates. And then here, you're only supposed to have probably three, six grams of sugar, and here this is 17. And you already had well over your sugar just with this. And because some of the carbohydrates that will turn into sugar plus the sugar high here, then uh, hey, you can't have anything else. Obesity is a, the major risk factor for diabetes, and that's why we're seeing it exploding in the United States. We as a nation have become much heavier this generation than they were any time in the past. My mother really didn't have much uh, at all. My father didn't have any. See, that was a generation in which there were not fast foods. Back then, they would have their uh, grease from animals they killed. You have to read the labels because um, uh, companies will put in whatever, a filler, they call it fillers, to make it taste good, look good, feel good. And from what I understand, food is not the culprit of all these diseases or most of them. It's the fillers that's in it to make it taste good, look good, smell good, whatever. You've got to be educated. As tribal people and similar people, you know, we need to all band together. We're never too old to make a difference in our own lives. How you doing? Hey, how you doing? All right, I'm here for my three-month checkup. Okay, sign in. All right, doctor in. Hi, Eric. Eric Osceolo has watched his diet, he's exercised, he's lost significant weight. His blood sugars are well controlled. The big um, issue that Eric faces is that this is a lifetime process. He's been very successful in his quest this year. This is something, though, he has to pursue for the rest of his life. Thank Keep you. up the good work, okay? Eric is a, a good example of somebody who, in his earlier life, ignored the good health practices, but who, before he had severe complications, um, committed to changing his life, committing to controlling his diabetes. As such, he's going to prolong his life, be much more active in whatever venture he chooses. This summer, 
come along for the ride. This SMPW workshop was an incredible opportunity, not just for the kids, but for us as mentors. And it's really amazing to see these young native youth wanting to be storytellers for their community. You know, I thought it was really great too that Phyllis conducted the interview. It showed that not only did she learn a lot this week, but she and her uncle had this moment where they really connected culturally, and I thought that was really beautiful to watch. What advice do you have for the young people today? The main advice I would have is to stay motivated with uh, physical activities and uh, get some knowledge on, I don't know if any of you guys have knowledge on diabetes or any family members that have diabetes you know myself I got it so you know that's why I'm here you know I'm trying to make a difference not only in our tribe and our community but you know as as a whole as you know in general is there hope for the future in diabetes absolutely I think it needs to be approached uh, both from the medical and research perspective but also from the societal perspective for type 1 diabetes uh, Places like the Diabetes Research Institute are working towards trying to find a cure for individuals who don't have any insulin production left. For individuals with type 2 diabetes, we still don't quite understand what causes the loss of insulin producing function. However, we do know that in a lot of those individuals, if we are effective in terms of getting them to lose weight, exercise, be more physically active. In a lot of them, we can not only control the diabetes, in some of them we can actually reverse the diabetes. And the main thing is to, you know, be involved with uh, your health. Not just diabetes, everything in general. Be involved with your health. Stay motivated, eat right, and do what you gotta do, you know, stay in school, do all the whole nine yards, but your health, stay involved with it. All right, just finished up at the doctor's appointment. Um, had some good results, uh, halfway to my goal. It's gonna be a life's journey, but, you know, staying positive and keep it moving, keep busy, and keep it real. Mm -hmm.